Welcome to our discussion on applications and functions in business and economics. So we're basically going to be looking at um, the basic building blocks of functions and how they work, but um, the ones that are geared towards business and economics. So you can see that we're going to looking at we're going to look at total cost, total revenue, profit functions, marginal cost, marginal revenue, uh, marginal profit, right? All these types of things, break even points, market equilibrium. And we're going to see how um, they all just relate back to the basic properties of functions. So first, let's start with total cost, total revenue, and then, of course, profit. All right, so if you didn't already know, profit is simply revenue minus cost. It's that simple. So if you have a profit, if you're looking for a profit function and you're given a revenue function and a cost function, all you have to do is subtract the cost function from the revenue function. And if you remember how to subtract a function from another function, really all you're doing is the basic algebra, right? So um, if you have something as simple as, let's say our revenue function was, um, you know, uh, x squared plus 3x minus 10. Sorry, that's our revenue. And then our cost function, let's just say, is uh, 12x plus uh, 100. Then you're just going to take this and subtract that from it, right? So it's going to be x squared plus 3x minus 10, subtracting this whole thing, 12x plus 100. So you have to remember you're subtracting each piece. So it's x squared plus 3x minus 10 minus 12x minus 100. Then you combine like terms, right? You put the x's together, and you get x squared minus 9, right, because you have 3 minus 12, and then minus 10 minus 100, you get minus 110. And that would be your profit function. Okay, it's literally that simple. Don't overthink it. We're just, we're just subtracting some stuff. So revenue is found by using the equation that revenue is going to be your price per unit times your number of units. If that's a, you know, if you have a very basic revenue function. And then cost is composed of two parts, your fixed cost and your variable cost. So with my cost function example here, my fixed cost was 100 and my variable cost was uh, 12x, 12 times every unit produced. And then if we were going to have a basic uh, revenue function, it would have just been the 3x and we wouldn't have had these pieces. So here's another simple example, right? A firm manufactures MP3 players, sells them for $50 each. The costs incurred in the production and sale of the players are $200,000 plus $10 for each player produced and sold. So obviously the $200,000 is the fixed cost. That's things like advertising, you know, warehouse uh, space, you know, all the things that don't change regardless of how many things you produce. And then as you produce them, obviously it costs $10 to produce each one. That would be the parts, the labor, things like that. So you can set up your total cost function as 10x plus 200,000. The reason why it's 10x, remember, is it's $10 for each player produced. And we're going to let x represent the number of players produced and sold, right? It's the same thing because we're going to assume we're going to sell everything we produce because it'd be kind of silly not to. So there's our simple cost function, the 10x plus 200,000. Now the profit function is going to be revenue minus cost. And we saw that our revenue function was simply just 50x because we sell each MP3 player for $50, right? So x is how many we sell times 50. So 50x is our revenue. We subtract the cost function from it. We do the basic algebra of 50x minus 10x, which is a 40x. And then, of course, subtracting the 200,000. And there is our profit function. Nice and simple and easy. We can graph all of them. Here's our revenue. Here's our cost. Here's our profit. And then that way we can figure things out. You know, like, for instance, with the uh, profit function, we can figure out what our break-even point is, right? And it looks like, if you know, if this is... 4,000, this is 8,000, this is 6,000. It looks like we got to have about 5,000 sales um, to break even. And of course, you could take this function, set it equal to zero and solve, and you would see that the answer would be exactly 5,000. So you have to sell 5,000 to break even. And then of course, everything after that is pure profit, which is kind of nice. 
Okay, now marginal profit for, for the product, the marginal profit um, for the MP3 players in example one is $40. And what marginal profit is, it's the slope of the profit function because it, it tells you how much money you make for each additional item produced. That's what marginal anything is. Marginal is always one more unit. So marginal profit is how much profit you produce after one more unit is you know sold. And since our profit function is 40x minus 200,000, you can see that as x goes up, if we increase x by 1, we get an extra 40, right? That And that's the slope of our line. mx plus b, right? So our slope is 40, and our intercept b is negative 200,000. So the slope is the same thing as our marginals, and so we see that we're making $40 for each additional unit uh, produced. Now the marginal cost is the slope of the cost function, but it's also just our variable cost, right? Because for every new um, item produced, it costs us $10. Here's our cost function. If we graph that, we know that this is slope, right? Y equals MX plus B. So again, M is our slope, it's 10, but that's just telling us that it's costing us $10 per unit produced. So that's our marginal cost that we just, it's gonna cost us an extra $10 for everything we make, right? So that's marginal cost. Um, and so we've got marginal profits, marginal costs, or, you know, marginal revenue, marginal cost. Marginal revenue, right, is, is different than uh, marginal profit because marginal profit is how much the profit goes up, which was um, $40 each because of the cost. And then, of course, marginal revenue, we're looking at just how much the revenue goes up, which in this case is 50. Again, it always comes back to slopes, right? If we look at at all three of our lines, our revenue function has a slope of 50, so its marginal revenue is 50. Our cost has a slope of 10, so marginal cost is 10. Our profit has a function, or sorry, a slope of 40, and so it has a marginal of 40. So those are marginals. Nice and simple. Don't overthink them. Break-even points. Well, we know a break-even point is just where cost and revenue are the same, i.e., it's when profit equals zero. So you could always kind of um, solve them two different ways. You can set your cost function equal to your revenue function and solve, or you can take your profit function, set it equal to zero and solve. They do the exact same thing. So here's an example, right? You sell a profit for $10, uh, sorry, you sell a product for $10 per unit. Their variable costs are 250 per unit, and the cost of 100 units is 1,450. How many units must the manufacturer produce each month to break even? So given that information, we can figure some things out. The revenue for X units of the product is just going to be 10X because it tells us we make $10 per unit sold. So the equation for our total revenue is simply just 10X. Now, the equation for the cost, right, is we know that we um, we get uh, 1450 was our cost when we sold 100 units. So we can figure out um, what our function is that way. Now you might be asking yourself, how the heck did they get this equation here? And I would say the same thing. It seems like there's some magic going on here what I would do is I would just write down what they tell me, right? I know that my cost function is going to be 250, right? 2.5 times every unit plus some fixed cost that I don't know what that is. I also know that if I produce 100 units, this is how much it costs me. So I know that if I do 100 units, right, C of 100, which is going to equal 2.5 times 100 plus this fixed cost that I don't know what it is, I know that's going to equal 1450. Okay, so let's do the math. 2.5 times 100, that's 250, plus my fixed cost has to equal 1450. Subtract 250 from both sides, and I get that my fixed cost is... 1200. So, ta-da! That's how we get to there. And I honestly have no idea what the book was thinking with this. I think it's much easier to just 
Think about it logically, right? What is a basic cost function? It's variable cost plus fixed cost. They gave us the variable cost. They didn't give us the fixed cost. So we just give that you know, a variable. We just call it FC for fixed cost, and we have to solve for that later. Then they give us a scenario where if we sell 100 units, it's going to cost a total cost of 1450 So we just plug that in, right? We plug in 100 um, for our units. We plug in 1450 for our total cost, and then we do the math. Variable cost of 250 times that 100 units, that gives us a variable, a total variable cost of $250, plus our fixed cost has to equal 1450 Subtract that variable cost from both sides, and we get a fixed cost of 1200 That's how I would tackle these things. I don't know what the heck they're doing. But in any case, we now have a cost function. Once we have a cost function, we can set that equal to our revenue function and solve, right? So we subtract the, the two... 0.5x from both sides, we get 7.5x equals 1,200. Divide both sides by 7.5 to solve for x, and we see that we have to produce 160 units to break even. If we were to graph our two functions, we can graph the cost function, we can graph the revenue function. Whenever the revenue function is below the cost function, we're making less than we're spending, and we're losing money. So that's why this is the loss region, where the intersect that's the break-even point because that's where cost and revenue equal the same. Remember that the, the height of these things is their output, how much money we get, right? So um, as we go up, <clears throat> that's revenue going up and cost going up, right? So cost starts at 1,200, revenue starts at zero, and, and they, they go up from there. Anywhere that the revenue function is above the cost function, that's where we're making a profit. Because the different in heights, right? We're making this much revenue for this many units, right? So at 280, we go up here, and here's our cost for 280 units. Here's our revenue for 280, and then obviously revenue minus cost. That's how much profit we make for 280 units. Okay, supply, demand, and market equilibrium. These are just basically um, some vocabulary words that you know kind of relate all these things together. They tell us that. Um, Points of intersection, we can use these to determine market, market equilibrium. Market, gosh darn it, market equilibrium occurs when the quantity of a commodity demand is equal to the quantity supplied. It's basically when supply equals demand. That's what market equilibrium is. Now, demand by consumers for a commodity is always related to the price of the commodity, right? I mean, if something is super expensive, we're going to want less of it. And if something is super cheap, we're going to want more of it. I mean, that's just the way humans work. And so the law of demand states that the quantity demanded will increase as the price decreases and that the quantity demanded will decrease as the price increases, right? I mean, that, again, it's the law of nature more, <laughs> more than the law of demand. And then, of course, the law of supply states that the quantity supplied for sale will increase as the price of the product increases. Because, again, why would you want to manufacture and sell something um, when you're not making a lot of money on it, right? The more money you're making, right? The more that the price goes up, the more that you're going to want to supply that stuff because then that means you're going to make more money. So when we take all those things and put them together, we can start seeing how these things work. So we have a supply line. We have a function that represents supply. We have a function that represents demand. And again, you can see supply goes up, right? Because down here, this is... Um, uh, quantity and this is price, right? So as price goes up, quantity goes up for supply, right? And as uh, price goes up, demand goes down, right? So that's how these two work. And then the equilibrium quantity is right here. So this is basically where supply and demand um, equal each other, which is you know a good place to be because it means everything you produce is being bought. You're not producing too much. You're not producing too little. So the equilibrium quantity is something that a lot of businesses are striving for. So the price at that point is called the equilibrium price. So whatever price um, makes the equilibrium quantity happen is the equilibrium price. And then, of course, that quantity is called the equilibrium quantity. So depending on how that works, from the previous example, we saw that it happens at the point 150 and 20. Again, we can look at it, see right here, 150 and 20. So that means the equilibrium quantity was 150, the equilibrium price was 20. So if we set the price at 20, the marketplace, right, consumers are going to be willing to um, uh, buy 150 units, and that's how many um, we would produce 
to basically um, equal out their demand. So we've seen that finding the points common to the graphs of two or more functions is called solving a system of equations or solving simultaneous. When, when, when things intersect and you figure out what that intersection point is, that's basically a way of, of solving both of those equations or multiple equations all at once. And it's called solving a system of equations or sometimes called solving simultaneously. It's usually called solving a system of equations. So if you want to find the equilibrium um, point for something or if you want to solve for a system of equations, right? Anytime you have two or more equations, the way to do that is to either graph it and figure out um, where they intersect, which is a big pain in the butt and not always accurate. Or the easier way to do it is to set the two equations equal to each other and solve. So that's what we would do here, right? Since we these are both um, functions uh, related to price, right? Uh, equals this, right? And, and supply price equals this. So we could set the top one equal to the bottom one since they're both equal to P, right? If this is equal to P and P is equal to this, then the transitive theory tells us that this stuff is equal to that stuff. And that's all we do here. And then we can do a little math, right? Add the, the 3Q over here to get 7Q. Subtract the 1 over here. And now we have 35 equals 7Q. Divide both sides by 7, we get Q equals 5. Take that and plug it back into either of these. We should get the same answer for both. So it's always a good idea to plug it in here, plug in 5, right, get 21. Then plug it in here, get negative 15, which gives you 21 as well. And you go, yay, it works in both, right? It gives us, gives us the same answer for both. So we know that it's correct. We didn't mess up our math. And therefore, the equilibrium, sorry, the equilibrium point is 5 and 21, a quantity of 5, a price of 21. Now, what about when we have to deal with taxation, right? Supply and demand with uh, taxation. So suppose a supplier is taxed for uh, K dollars per unit sold, and the tax is passed on to the consumer by, of course, adding that K dollars to the selling price of the product. So if the original supply function was F of Q gives the supply price per unit, then if we add a tax, all we have to do is slap on that K to the end of the function. And because the value of the product is not changed by the tax, the demand function is unchanged. So the demand function stays the same, but the supply function right goes up. And you can see that all that happens, the demand function stays the same. The supply function has the same um, slope because we just added a constant to it. So it just basically moves vertically up by that k amount right so here's that k amount that everything's been raised up and we find a new equilibrium point after the tax here's a simple example supply and demand functions for dryers are given as follows here's supply here's demand right the equilibrium point if we solve these two is 40 units at 250 bucks now if the wholesaler is taxed 14 dollars per unit sold and they pass that on to their consumers, then of course we have a new um, function for price, and now we have to solve this new system. We still have the original um, minus 5q plus 450 demand function. Now we have the new uh, price function, right, of 2q plus 184. Or I'm sorry, supply function. I keep calling it price function, supply function. And now we just set those two things equal to each other and solve and do the math. And we see that it changes, right? Instead of 40 units at $250, it's 38 units, right? Less, because remember the price went up. And there's the higher price, 260. So that's it, guys. That's, um, that's all the stuff to kind of work out when you're dealing with price, supply, demand, et cetera, et cetera.